Welcome back to Local Decision 2020. I'm Rusty Ray. We're joined now by Amir Malik, the DFL candidate for State House out of District 37A. Amir, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. What about this race? Why get into this this particular race and why this year? Well, you know, this is my second time running and I feel that Blaine deserves better representation than it's had. I mean, you know, my family and I chose to live in Blaine. I was born and raised in rural Illinois, but we chose to raise our family here and buy our first home. And I want more for Blaine. I mean, I see that there hasn't been the change that's needed. We're, we're growing and our infrastructure has not been matching our growth. And I wanna see things like Highway 65 being better. And just, I want the people of Blaine to be able to achieve their potential. In the uh, materials that you submitted for us here at North Metro TV, and we've supplied as much information about as many candidates who responded at NorthMetroTV.com, it seems like you lay out many of the same goals and many of the same uh, areas of interest that you have in leading uh, as your opponent. It seems like you all you are pretty much the same. You mentioned uh, transportation and you mentioned those kinds of things, and he has talked a lot about that. Is there something I'm missing here? You did list uh, legalization of cannabis. We can talk about that in a moment, but is there something I'm missing here? It sounds like you both have similar, uh, similar things that you would like to see done at the state house. Well, you know, I, I don't view, uh, you know, being a politician as a career and people may have the same goals, but it comes down to effectiveness and things aren't getting done in Blaine. And so, yes, there, both people may want something, but if it's not getting done, then I believe that, you know, Blaine needs change and it needs better representation. Do you feel like Highway 65 is the biggest example of that? Or is there some other example you feel like is just as glaring that, as you say, things aren't getting done? Well, you know, if you see like the infrastructure bills, you know, the roads and bridges hasn't been passed now in years. And our current representative voted against the, uh, the bill this year. And I think, you know, we, we have to focus on the needs of Blaine. Whatever the goals are in the end, either you get something done or not. And that's always how I, I think we need to be results oriented. Just because someone is in politics doesn't mean we should treat it differently than any other job. So what else is there? What else would you like to see uh, happen? And, and again, COVID is something we can talk about in just a moment and its impacts on, on this, uh, on agendas and on other things things happening at the, at the state capitol, but what else is there out there for Blaine that you see as major concerns? Well, I, I think we're not uh, funding education as it needs to be. Um, you know, while I am an attorney now, I, I did teach for 10 plus years. And, you know, it was really sad, the seven students who committed suicide at Blaine High School in the past year. And as someone who has, you know, four children myself, I mean, every life matters and we have to realize that, you know, they're going through a lot and Minnesota is 48th in America and it's counselor to student ratio, one counselor for every 700 students. I'm also a volunteer attorney with the Children's Law Center. So I deal with people who come from broken homes many times due to uh, drug addiction by parents or mental health issues. And I don't think it's being addressed um, at all at the level that it needs to be. You know, I have clients and they're up in Mille Lacs. Uh, so it's like a two hour drive because that's the nearest place that has a spot for them, which takes them even further from their family, makes them feel isolated. Um, I had one who was moved from um, now then and then up to Mille Lacs, but we're, we're just not, we're not investing in our youth the way we need to be. We're not meeting their needs and I, it, it, it makes me feel bad. I really think that we can do more for the young people in Blaine. Speaking about specific programming that could be offered, more staffing, and you mentioned the counselor to student ratio, uh, you know, and, and to address the only thing really that's been out there to address this, uh, this crisis, as we can call it there at Blaine High School in the past year, year and a half, a Blaine police put out some materials and say, here are some ways that we can help young people and, and we're a resource and you can be a resource but you're saying the state can do more and putting resources, real money resources into doing things, more facilities, uh, more staff, what kinds of things? Well, two things. Number one, we definitely need more counselors. I mean, I can't imagine being responsible for 700 students. 
I mean, even teaching multiple sections in a school year, I've never been responsible for more than 120 students as a teacher. So I can't imagine 700. So that's one. But two, we, have, we don't have enough treatment centers. You know, years ago, Minnesota had those large psychiatric hospitals. And then those were closed down. And they, we were told they're going to have these smaller regional ones so you can be near, you know, closer to family and community. That didn't happen. And so now there aren't spots available. I, uh, I had a client and with like two days notice, he had to be moved to uh, uh, a residential center because a spot suddenly came open and they didn't want to lose it. So he kind of lost that kind of transition period. And, you know, when you're 11, 12 years old, um, it, it's difficult. And I have, uh, I have talked to families who have had people commit suicide, um, you know, just through my door knocking, you know, I, I remember two years ago, I knocked at the door of a Blaine resident and uh, her sister had killed herself that day. Uh, she was an adult and she wanted help. And after 72 hours at the hospital, they said, I'm sorry, there's no, there's no spot available for you. And she went home and then she killed herself. And these are really sad. I mean, this is our community just because it's not talked about a lot. Um, mental health services, uh, drug addiction services, these things are really important. And I do think that just from a humanity standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, it's good for Blaine to have these services available for people who need them. Other services uh, that you see the state could help with or could provide more of uh, out there, you, you mentioned education. Um, a lot of this though kind of being pushed aside because of the immediate or past immediate needs of COVID. Uh, do you see anything else that the state maybe should have been taking up this year or it started taking up but then the decisions uh, regarding COVID and, and the response to that had maybe pushed aside? Well, I think we should be making it easier for uh, people to get health care. You know, one concern I have is I feel that our health care system is tilted very strongly towards large corporations. And if you work in a small business or, you know, a nonprofit organization, you're really at a disadvantage. Like when you're trying to compete for workers and, and I, I think Minnesota needs to move away from that. It's, it can be very difficult for small businesses to get health care for their employees. And I think in that case, we need to make it much easier for people to buy it from the state, um, uh, being able to buy into Minnesota care. Because, you know, you know, yes, the big employers are important, but we have to remember some of these small businesses in Blaine, if we give them the proper support, who knows what their future is going to be? They might be the next, you know, Google or Apple. And it shouldn't be the idea that if you're not a large business, you don't matter. I think small businesses are very important. I love seeing that creativity of people right as they come out of college and they're, or, or, or even out of high school and they have those ideas in mind. And I just don't think the state has been supportive enough on making those appealing places to work and making it appealing to open your own business. How would you grade the state government's response to COVID uh, given kind of a seemed more unified at the beginning and the governor had to make some decisions and the governor had to put some powers into place. But as the summer wore on and he kept extending that, we started to hear more partisan bickering uh, from the state capitol and special sessions being called and then some actions taken during those special sessions that some saw as retribution. But again, it's that partisan flavor to things. How would you grade the state's response to COVID so far? Well, I think the governor tried to do the best he could. I mean, it is difficult. This is uh, uncharted territory. Um, I've been, you know, I know he, he looks to uh, defer to um, scientists and experts, and I believe in that. I, I believe in science. I don't think that um, just someone just off the top of their head as a politician should be making these decisions. Uh, you should look to people who have, you know, experts in epidemiology and infectious diseases. I've been much more disappointed in the legislature um, because if they were passing bills and dealing with it, then it, it would make it much more clear that the governor's uh, powers are not needed. Because the legislature could say, look, we took care of it. We've agreed on this bill. We've agreed on this. And I think sometimes it, the, the easy way out is not to do anything so you can blame somebody else. And I, I think we see, this in, uh, we see this in Washington and we see this in St. Paul, where 
whether it's Congress or our, our legislature, if you don't actually meet your responsibility, then someone else has to fill that vacuum. And I think ideally it should not be the governor. Um, and I hope that the legislature will start to, uh, uh, you know, take its responsibility seriously, the, the House and the Senate, and so that the governor can go back to managing and not dealing so much with policy. One of the major responsibilities in the new session in the new year and with a new legislature will be uh, the biennial uh, budget process and putting together a new state budget. It started the year obviously with a large projected uh, surplus and is now gonna end the year with a large, large projected uh, deficit. Uh, what ideas would you have to look at ways uh, to take the resources that are now compromised by this economic situation and and try to look at maybe different ways to increase or in, do some of these things that you're talking about uh, when it comes to spending or diverting resources? Well, you know, a, a few of the things, you know, we have to remember that, you know, not everybody had a decrease in their income. There, as we know, there are people who've had very large increases in their income also. So we, we need to, you know, look at the whole picture and see where support is needed. And I don't think it needs to be across the board. Um, I think there are many small businesses where we're not spending enough time uh, listening to what they need. Sometimes it's small. So, you know, as you know, my, my day job is I'm a wage theft investigator. I work for the city of Minneapolis. So I deal with a lot of small businesses and you'll see, you know, I talk with them regularly. The things that are important to them and things that are hurting them, like being able to play on a level playing field. You know, they feel that there are other businesses that don't follow the law and they profit tremendously off of it. But also having a guidance, making it through our system of regulations and everything. You know, I've met businesses who it's not, in, especially the, the very small ones, you know, five, six employees who, who can use guidance from the government on how to deal with things like payroll, how to you know, I was disappointed with how that paycheck protection program worked out because it seemed, at least my interactions with small businesses, small businesses had a really difficult time getting money and large, well-connected businesses did great. And I just think that was unfortunate. I do believe some businesses closed that did not have to close in the state they, they, because they could not get the resources they needed because they didn't have a connection to a really large bank or a prestigious law firm. And I think we're going to have some regrets that there were some great ideas that were out there in small businesses. And, you know, I, I feel the government needs to be more supportive of small businesses and understand that their needs are different. It goes across sector and you have to really invest in, in learning about them and their needs. But long term, it's going to be much better for Minnesota if we're being supportive of these businesses. You know, we started this conversation by you talking about your decision and your family's decision to raise a family and to move and to settle in Blaine. What do you think uh, Blaine's going to look like in the next 10 to 15 years? And specifically, what do you think your role as a state legislator could do to help shape that future? Well, I think it's going to be uh, a successful city. And I think it's going to be less dependent on other cities. I mean, that is one of the goals I have for Blaine is a united Blaine, not split between East and West because of Highway 65 with overpasses. So, you know, we do business with each other. You know, people are comfortable going to all the businesses throughout Blaine, but also with amenities that make us, you know, instead of everybody leaving to spend their money, so people are coming here to spend money. I mean, I, I love the sports center, but things like having, you know, I, I hope to be supportive for other amenities like community centers. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I love the community center in Shoreview. I mean, it is, it, it is very family friendly. It has something for everyone. And I wanna focus on, you know, the Blaine we're, we're developing, which is, there's a lot, it's a, Blaine is very family oriented. You know, we have a lot of young families, a lot of good people, and, you know, we should try to have them um, enjoy themselves as much as possible in Blaine, and I hope to be supportive towards that. Okay, Amir, thank you very much for your time. We're going to have to leave it at that. 
Thank you so much for having me. All right.